I'm going to hit a few points. I really appreciate the invitation today to address your delegates and your guests. It's an honor. I have a presentation, but it's going to go quick. I promise to be fastest. How's that? Uh, I'm going to hit three subjects, one which is our least favorite, which we'll get to. I'm going to hit some statistics to let you know how the international is doing, um, how the ports are doing compared to everybody else. And then I'm going to talk about some of the great work we've done together and some of the things I think we can do a little bit better. So I thought I'd start out today by touching on a subject that I also talked about at the ACD presentation, but it bears repeating a subject which is still the bane of our existence in New York and New Jersey, and you've heard it from Harold, and you've heard it from Joe, and you've heard it from others, and you've heard it from the legislators. It's the special challenges we face with the governmental agency which dishes out ever-changing levels of oversight and rules for compliance. Again, like I said last week, in some cases, a degree of oversight is not bad. You know, we only want good people uh, in the industry, people of good character, do background checks. I like the fixed register. We know who the people are in New York who are the longshoremen. They're professional people. We train them, and they make careers out of it. However, this is not just affecting the ILA membership. Our employers need to run their own businesses, and this agency is trying to run their business for them, and we can't let that happen. We can't let them... <clears throat> we can't let them justify their existence by changing the business rules every time a decision needs to be made. And that's the Waterfront Commission. So, however, like also like I've said in the past, we can't let the Waterfront Commission be the reason why our port does not progress with our productivity goals. I've said it before and I've said, I'll say it again. In the end, only the worker and the employer suffer if we don't move forward. So please be assured that the NYSA will continue to work with the ILA to move forward while the Waterfront Commission exists and we're going to work together to modernize how the oversight in our port will exist in the future. Next slide. I'll give you a brief overview of how we're doing in the Maine to Texas ports uh, compared to their competition since we last met in 2015, four years ago, right? So here, this is volume. We're doing pretty good, I have to say, in the Maine to Texas range, right? Since 2015, the Canadian ports have taken a, um, you know, a huge step uh, in growth moving forward. Uh, they grew over 20%. This is, you know, really mainly due to the devalued Canadian dollar or, you know, the value of the Canadian dollar. It's difficult to compete cost-wise when everything, such as terminal handling, rail transport, and truck transport are at a 25% discount. However, growth from Maine to Texas was an impressive 16.4%. And growing, but not nearly as the same pace as Canada and the East Coast with the West Coast ports, at 12.6%. If anybody wants these stats and figures, see me, I'll give them to you. They come from the Journal of Commerce with their uh, top 25 uh, ports. Next, we talk about market share. Cargo growth can be deceiving. When you grow, but not as fast as other ports, you lose market share. When you lose market share, it reduces your value as a port and as an economic engine, and that eventually affects investments, right? You can see in this chart that Canada's market share has increased, and the East and Gulf Coast ports have also increased quite handsomely. However, West Coast ports have decreased. It looks like the impact of the Panama Canal expansion, the East Coast Channel deepening, and the raising of the Bayonne Bridge roadway is beginning to have the impact of shifting freight as we had anticipated, right? So it's good news for the East and Gulf Coast. So that's the update on the volume and market share. Now we get to the uh, media part of the presentation. New technology versus automation. It's a hot button topic nowadays. You know, but I've, what's the difference between them? I think sometimes they get lumped together and, and I don't think that's always correct. New technology allows you to handle more freight within the current limited land and resources involving labor. Automation can exclude human intervention, right? New technology will have to come to be able to use the limited land resources that we have. Land is fixed, volume will grow. 
New York is a prime example where new technology will be required. In a place like New York, we have very limited land to expand. Once the additional land is used up, we'll have to expand vertically and increase velocity. Another one of my favorite subjects, productivity. One of the key points uh, at our bargaining in New York. To me, it's the most critical issue for our industry, is productivity. New York and New Jersey, for example, has a productivity, uh, a robust productivity improvement plan. We work closely with all the locals and Dennis and Harold with the employers to try and improve productivity. And we've really put the responsibility for this improvement on the foreman, right? It's not on just management, it's the foreman who's running the business, who's supposed to make the decisions to get the productivity up, right? So we've been working closely with the, with the leadership, and again, the labor force performing is a key to productivity, right? So, productivity versus automation. It's been stated over and over that workers can outperform automated machines, and this is the key to avoiding automation. I've said it, Harold said it, I've heard other people say it. Automation, however, however, automation is a solution to productivity when it doesn't happen, right? So, yes, there are reasons why labor cannot be expected to perform in all cases. For example, there's factors outside of their control. There's weather. There's poor stowage, machinery breakdowns, lack of training, fatigue, congestion in the yard, and there's even the slight possibility that there's lousy management. That can happen too, I guess. But what about the factors within their control? This is the one that's driving me nuts. Absenteeism. And people who haven't worked all weekend that don't show up on Monday, or they don't show up after a holiday, accepting an order you don't show up for because you were hoping for something else. It's not protecting the work, right? We need to protect the work, and I think everybody in this room knows that. And this is not a New York problem. This is a coastwise problem. Everybody I speak to in nearly every port up and down the coast is facing the same thing. In New York alone, we estimated the cost of $6 million to pay in empty wages for people that don't show up to have to pay their replacements. It costs millions in lost vessel productivity. How can anybody say they don't want automation when they don't want to show up and protect the work? I don't get that. Okay? And I also realize that 90% of the workforce show up when they're supposed to, they do what they're supposed to do, they great, do a great job, and they even cover for the 10% that aren't showing up. But 10%, 10% in New York, 350 people we're talking about. 10% down the coast, we're talking about 1,000 people. So, I hear all the time, workers can outperform automation but talk and reality have to eventually meet up with each other. So I put up this slide at the ACD, and I asked any, if anybody knew who this person is. Um, I think many people recognize this as Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, if you watched it. If you didn't watch it, that's who it is. But whatever, whether you recognize him or not, I think you can agree he's in quite a precarious situation. And in my opinion, and this is just John Nardi's opinion, with the way in which some of the workforce doesn't show up to work, for me, this picture represents Harold in his fight against automation. Now, Jon Snow's army swept in and took the challenge, right? He, they came from behind right after this picture and met them head on. But we need to get this done. We need to get the people to show up. So sorry to rant on a subject, but we work really well together. And I think if we can get this one item out of the way, we would move our productivity numbers to the point where we don't have much to talk about in a few years. So, President Daggett, thank you very much. Thank you. Say it.